a time when things are shifting. We're gonna, there can be a new world order out there. And we've got to lead it. The following program is brought to you by friends and partners of End Time Headlines. Welcome to the broadcast today. This is End Time Headlines, news and headlines from a prophetic perspective. Today is Thursday, May 19th, and we welcome you to the broadcast. If this is your first time joining us, if this is the first time you've ever been a part of our live broadcast, or maybe you're this is the first time you've watched this on the rebroadcast of this, we want to welcome you to the broadcast. Again, I'm your host, founder, pastor, and voice of End Time Headlines, Ricky Scaparo. And uh, let us know where you guys are joining us from in the comment section below. If there is somewhere that you can comment, uh, we would love to hear from you or uh, at least give us some feedback where you guys are joining us from. Today, I'm going to talk about an interesting topic. Today, I'm going to talk about everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Uh, this is going to be kind of ironic. I will elaborate more on that at the end of this broadcast. But at the beginning of this, I want to give you three verses or three passages of Scripture. This is the, going to be the context of every. Thing that we're going to report to you today is going to be found in the context of Matthew 24, 6 and 8, Luke 21, 10 through 11, and Luke 25, 21, 25 and 26. Oh, let me read these to you and we'll get after this today. I'm going to, we're going to touch on every one of these topics today. Verse Matthew 24, 6 and 8, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars and see that you're not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, a kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. That's Matthew 24, 6 and 8. Now I'm going to hop down here to Luke 21, 25 and 26. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, or we would we say in the heavens and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the seas and waves roaring, and men's hearts fell in them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. That's Luke 21, 25, and 26. And then Luke 21, 10, and 11. And then he said unto them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes in various places, and famines, and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights, and great signs from heaven. Now, I want to say that we are seeing a great shaking in the earth, not just in America, but, uh, uh, but in the earth itself, in regards to the economy, in regards to the earth and travailing and birth pangs, in regards to earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, wildfires, and disasters, we're seeing shakings in regards to great and fearful sights from heaven. We're seeing uh, the we're seeing the shaking and dealing with conflicts regarding nations and kingdoms in the earth. So we're gonna. Today's program, we're going to go over a lot of things today. So I want you to buckle up. I want you to set tight. And I'm just going to overload you with some information. And we're going to close it with some revelation. All right. So here we Israel is set to simulate a military strike on Iran. And what is being deemed the largest Israeli defense force drill in the Jewish nation's History, according to multiple reports uh, from the Jerusalem Post, the Times of Israel, and others, the, ID, the IDF will simulate striking targets 
far from Israel's borders with a large number of planes while simultaneously acquiring new targets on various fronts in real time during its largest military drill in history, according to a new report from the Jerusalem Post. The drill is unique and unprecedented in scope and will enable the army to maintain high level of readiness and in, quote, ever-changing region, according to the IDF. It aims to improve the military's capabilities in an intense multi-front and prolonged war on, on all its borders. In other words, this drill that they're going to conduct is in preparation of them being attacked on multiple fronts, not just from Iran, but perhaps Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, perhaps Turkey, even Russia. We'll get to more of that in just a second. Uh, kind of like what Psalms 83 talks about in forecast, kind of like what Ezekiel 38, 39 seems to indicate and will happen in the future when Israel will be surrounded by multiple nations or a coalition of multiple nations that will come together with the intent to wipe out Israel and to acquire uh, substances or things or resources, if you would, that are not readily available to them when that war breaks loose. And we've talked about that in another podcast, such as if there's a famine, such as there is a disaster, such um, as there is oil uh, restrictions or whatever the case would be. Something, again, is going to be multiple hooks that will be put in the jaws of these nations like Persia, which is Iran, and Turkey, and the southern, so, southern Soviet Russian nations, and different nations that will be drawn into these attacks. But Israel is aware that they're living in uh, very uh, tumultuous times. There's been countless attacks against them by Hezbollah, Hamas, and all these Arab Muslim factions in the West Bank and in Gaza. And, uh, and there's even something even more of a greater concern and that is Iran's nuclear developments and capabilities. Quote, according to the report, the IDF will simulate striking targets from Israel's borders with, again, a large number of planes while simultaneously acquiring new targets on various front, fronts in real time during this largest military in history. On Tuesday, Israel's defense minister warned that Iranian efforts to, pur to purify uranium have exceeded figures from a March report by the United Nations. Quote, Iran continues to accumulate irreversible knowledge and experience in the development, research, production, and operation of advanced centrifuges. Uh, he said this during a conference, according to the Times of Israel. He went on to say that, listen to this quote, Iran stands just a few weeks away from attaining fissile material needed for a first bomb. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about, according to reports coming out of the Middle East, coming out of Israeli affiliates, Israel is now in uh steeped readiness and preparation in the advance that either with the help and support of America and Britain and whoever else would take the alliance of Israel or without their help, Israel is ready to defend themselves, A, or B, prevent Iran, aka Persia, from developing nuclear weapons that they have threatened to use on Israel to begin with. So this is going to be, we need to keep our eyes on this. This is going to be really interesting. Speaking of very interesting, uh, according to Israel's local affiliate ch channel 13 news, Russian forces reportedly opened fire on Israeli fighter jets while they were allegedly carrying out airstrikes in Syria this past or this last week. Now, why is that interesting? Because Syria has a prophecy over them 
in Isaiah 17, in which the prophet said and foretold that the day would come when Syria would, and Syria is the capital of, uh, of, of, or I'm sorry, Damascus, sorry, Damascus is the capital of Syria, and the prophet foretold a day when Damascus would be, and I quote, become a ruinous heap. In other words, the prophet said that he's, the prophet foretold a day when Damascus, the capital of Syria, would be wiped out. It would be destroyed. It would become a ruinous heap. That has not happened in our lifetime. Number one, that's interesting. Number two, it was Russian forces that opened fire on Israeli fighter jets. Again, Ezekiel 38 tells us in the Gog Magog war that Russia will be one of the nations that will be involved in this coalition of nations that will come and invade Israel. So again, we're seeing the initial steps to this. The 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 the, the steps leading up to the the final Portray the the the, the, uh, the final act of this, the final fulfillment of Ezekiel 38. According to the ch uh, uh, Channel 13 News, the incident took place on Friday of last week as Israeli pilots attacked Iranian link targets in southwestern Syria. Russian forces reportedly opened fire on pilots using advanced S-300 anti-aircraft missiles. Syrian state media said that Israeli missiles targeted the town of Masayef during the alleged airstrikes, killing five individuals, including a civilian, and injuring seven others. Again, if confirmed, this incident could mark a significant shift in Russia's attitude towards Jerusalem. Let me say that again. For all those who appreciate prophecy, quote, if this report is confirmed, this incident could, and I quote, mark a significant shift in Russia's attitude towards Jerusalem. The report went on to say that historically Israel has had strong ties with Russia and coordinates with Moscow on airstrikes against Iranian targets in Syria. Russia is a close ally of Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad and operates inside the war-torn country. Israel rarely ever acknowledges its, its activity in Syria, but views Iranian activity there as a major national security threat. So this is very intriguing. What am I talking about? There shall be wars and rumors of wars. Then we got a report. This came out today, a new report from MSN. And Bloomberg is reporting that China's top diplomat has once again warned the United States over its increased support for Taiwan. According to the report, this indicates the island democracy remains a major sticking point between the world's largest economies as Beijing sent more military aircraft towards the island. Quote, if the U.S. side insists on playing the Taiwan card and goes further and further down the wrong road, it will certainly lead to a quote, and I quote, a dangerous situation. This is according to Beijing's top diplomat. During a phone call with National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, their, uh, Beijing's top diplomat went on further and said that Washington should have, quote, a clear understanding of the situation. Again, according to the statement that was posted as well online by his nation's foreign ministry, he said, quote, China will certainly take firm action to safeguard its sovereignty and security interest. The White House also issued a short statement uh, on this past Wednesday in a call saying the pair, quote, focused on regional security issues and non-proliferation 
Quote, they also discussed Russia's war against Ukraine and specific issues in the U.S.-China relations. So this is an ongoing conflict, again, that's reaching a boiling point between China and Taiwan. And guess who's stuck in the middle of it? Of course, the United States of America. Then we had a report that came out today. This is breaking news. It came out today. U.S. assesses North Korea preparing for possible long-range missile test within days as Biden prepares to travel to Asia. So here, while we have American President Joe Biden preparing to visit Asia, North Korea, it, it appears that North Korea, Korea is preparing a possible intercontinental ballistic missile test within the next 48 to 96 hours, coinciding with President Joe Biden's scheduled travel to Asia. North Korea could be preparing for an intercontinental ballistic missile test even as it tackles its first COVID-19 outbreak. State media says leader Kim Jong-un has rebuked officials for failures in the country's pandemic response. But authorities in Pyongyang claim the coronavirus situation is improving and that new infections have declined this week. Lim Yun suk with this report. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un was seen wearing two masks inside this pharmacy in the capital Pyongyang earlier this week as he ordered pharmacies to remain open 24 hours and mobilized the military to stabilize its distribution of COVID-19 medicine in the city. State television showed one soldier standing on the road with a sign showing no entry. It also showed a soldier wearing a face shield and a protective suit, and soldiers working to disinfect areas in a building. But on Wednesday, state media cited North Korean officials claiming that the virus situation was improving thanks to the efficiency and scientific accuracy of the emergency virus measures in place. And pictures from KCNA showed Kim Jong-un and officials at a meeting without masks. However, experts in Seoul are doubtful that the situation is under control in North Korea amid concerns that it could devastate the country, which has limited medical supplies and no vaccine program in place. But even as the country battles its COVID-19 outbreak, South Korea's Deputy National Security Advisor Kim Tae-ho told reporters that Pyongyang could test its new intercontinental ballistic missile, the ICBM, while U.S. President Joe Biden visits Seoul later this week. But he said he didn't think North Korea would carry out a nuclear test. And if North Korea stages a serious provocation while President Biden is in Seoul, he said there was a plan B to ensure the combined defense Defense poister between the two countries. And again, all indicators are showing that North Korea again is preparing for a intercontinental long range ballistic missile test that is coinciding with Biden's visit to Asia. So look at this. The Lord said, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise against nation, a kingdom against kingdom. We've got Ukraine and Russia. We've got Israel and Iran. We've got China and Taiwan. And now we've got North Korea involved in the mix, who's threatening to again carry out these uh, ballistic missile tests as a sign of force against the United States of America. And again, here we are, the U.S., who is stuck in the middle of this, right in the right dab in the middle of all this mess. Okay? Then we have all the economists that are coming out. And they're warning. I'm talking red flags are all over the place that we are heading into a global deep recession. For example, the Bank of England has just sounded the alarm regarding, and I quote, a coming apocalyptic global food shortage. According 
to the telegram, the governor of the Bank of England has warned, uh, and he used the term apocalyptic in regards to a global food crisis and shortage where price rises uh, continue and said, quote, he is helpless in the face of surging inflation as the economy is battered by the war, the ongoing war in Ukraine. Andrew Bailey said he was, he said he has, quote, run out of horsemen. Look at the terms, guys, that are being used. Apocalyptic and horsemen. Hmm. I'm just saying, uh, he who has the ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Uh, these are just the terms, the verbiage is being used. When counting the shocks facing Britain with runaway energy and food costs driven by global market forces beyond his control, prices are rising at the fastest rate in over 30 years, creating a, quote, very big income shock that is expected to intensify in coming months with a risk of double digit inflation before the end of the year. Mr. Bailey told MPs on the Treasury Select Committee that he is increasingly concerned about a further surge in food costs if Ukraine, a major crop grower, is unable to ship wheat and cooking oils from its warehouses because of Russian blockade. The governor went on to say that he had spoken to Ukraine's finance minister and, and added, quote, the risk I'm going to sound or I'm sorry, he said, quote, the risk I'm going to sound rather apocalyptic about, I guess, is food. So he emphasizes what he is calling a apocalyptic is the food shortages on a global scale that he has seen. In a recent survey of 2000 Britons conducted by uh, multiple outlets, 89% of 2000 Britons that were surveyed said they quote, were concerned about how the cost of living crisis would affect the country as a whole over the next six months. While, while 83% were, con were concerned about their own personal circumstances. Again, a major British caterer said separately that schools we're now facing, quote, difficult decisions as to as whether to reduce meal sizes or use lower quality ingredients amid surging prices. They went on to say, quote, there is just so much uncertainty around this situation. Now, look, this is in Britain. Don't think that we're not going to see this come to our shores in America. Again, as there's, a, as there's more and more of a shortage of workers, as the recession deepens, as supplies get shortage, workers get shortage, there is going to be, uh, it's safe to say that uh, there's not going to be this, um, this urgency on safety. We're going to see more and more and more, I believe, recalls, uh, shortages, uh, just things that are going to be discovered in food that's going to cause, you know, that's going to call them to be recalled, the metal, the traces of metal, the, the E. coli outbreaks, and it goes on and on and on. And it's just, uh, uh, guys, I'm, this is just a mess. I don't know how to put it. Even the, the a CEO of Wells Fargo, has come out and warned, and, it, and he said, quote, there is no question about it. The worst is yet to come. Quote, the worst is yet to come. He said that, again, we are facing a long, strong, and deep recession. Mark, hey, you think we need to be prepared to eat that recession cake? Hey. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, when you're when you get stimmy check after stimmy check, unfortunately, you know, our economy is at a point where, you know, unfortunately, we're going to have to take our medicine. 
Um, if you just listen to what Jay Powell has said over the course of the last few months, he was all about soft landing, then soft landing became softish landing, whatever that means, and then that became things are going to be painful, which insinuates kind of a hard landing, right? Let's remember, you know, with the, with the economy slowing, the Fed has a dual mandate, price stability and full employment, not propping up the stock market, and despite what a lot of people believe, not avoiding recessions either. I understand there's a high correlation between the unemployment rate and recessions, but that is not a direct mandate. And look, consensus seems to believe right now that there's less than a 50% chance of a recession, that it would be next year, that it would be short and shallow. I disagree with all those things. I think the recession is going to be longer and deeper than most people believe it. Quote, it's going to be hard to avoid some kind of recession, he said during a Wall Street Journal live event. With consumers still spending and businesses financially healthy by most measures, the bank's chief executive said it will likely be a mild downturn in the beginning. Now, in other words, if you go on and read the rest of the article, he talks about if we can pull out of this thing in time, it would be mild. But if, if, if things don't start turning around quickly, if things don't start shifting, if things don't start changing, it's going to get really bad really soon. And this, again, he's only echoing uh, what others are saying. On that note, we're now being warned that we could possibly see, listen to this, $6 a gallon gas. For your money this morning, the pain at the pump is getting worse. It is, unfortunately. We had prices uh, jump overnight. The entire Bay Area now looks like everybody on average is above $6 a gallon. And we've sent Crown Force Camila Barco uh, on an impossible mission <laughs> to find cheap gas. So let's see what she's got. You're, you're wasting a lot of gas probably driving around at these stations. I'm just going to say I'm lucky that it is not my personal car, Daria. <laughs> the prices continue to go up. We have spent the entire morning driving around San Mateo County, specifically Millbrae. The cheapest gas we found was $5.95 at a local Arco station. But take a look. The most expensive we've seen this morning, $6.47 at a Chevron station here in Millbrae. I just kind of want to point out a few cars here pumping gas. But across the corner, $6.23 at Valero. You can choose where you want to put your gas. Some people decide to just go for the big name brands. Others decide to go for the cheapest. But of course, $5.95, the cheapest uh, price. And here's what a few drivers had to say about the high prices of gas. It's not even full yet. It takes like 90 $95. With gas prices skyrocketing, Wallet Abdallah is filling up his tank just enough to get him to where he needs to go. Not the whole tank, just to take me back to San Jose. The Uber driver says he is paying about triple the amount each month for gas than what he used to budget for. I have to put double the effort to just cover up for the gas expenses oh. on this. Yeah, it used to be like half. Right now, I have to do double the time. Anyways, it's so it's so ridiculous. Another Uber driver tells us he's spending double the amount to fill his tank. Six months ago, it cost me 40 bucks to fill this up. Now it's 95. He says the company has helped drivers at the pump, but the prices are jumping too quickly. It's around 22 bucks for every 40 jobs, right? But the gas prices are going up so so fast that Uber can't even keep up with the compensation. As of Thursday morning, San Francisco has the most expensive gas at $6.31. It drops to about $6.19 in the East and South Bay. And the cheapest gas you'll find in the Bay Area is in Solano County, just a little over the $6 mark. That's fun. Now, despite not living in California, Sarah Piombo says she's not doing any summer road trips. We're done with the trips. We're going to stay local. Uh, gas is just, it's killing us, and we're just going to find things to do as a family and um, enjoy where we are. AAA says the demand for gas has slightly decreased, but the high cost of crude oil is driving these pump prices up. 
Now, summer is approaching, Daria James, right around the corner. Triple A also says that the um, summer blend of gas is underway, and that normally adds 7 to 10 cents per gallon. And I just want to point out that in the last week, gas has gone up at least 20 cents. The average price for gasoline in California hit $6 a gallon on Tuesday for the first time. And one analysis at JP Morgan is warning that the price could be, th this could be the poster child for the entire nation. $6 or more a gallon. Guys, listen to me. Our country cannot sustain that. We will collapse. People will not be able to go to work. How are they going to, to do anything? We're not talking about traveling for a holiday or vacation or, or whatever. We're talking about just daily living, going to work and back and doing daily activities. According to a new, a new report, the startling forecast comes as U.S. gas prices have surged to record highs. Here it is in the aftermath of Russia's invasion of Ukraine casting a shadow over the economy. Quote, there is a real risk the price could reach $6 plus a gallon by this August, by this summer. Again, this is from multiple sources uh, that are, are saying this. And all this, the culmination of this has led to a bloodbath on Wall Street. The Dow yesterday plummeted over 1,100 points in the negative in what is being called the largest decline in two years. Now on your feet at five in what has already been a terrible year for Wall Street and our 401ks today was the single worst trading day that we've seen in almost two years. U.S. stocks dropping near record amounts after a series of disappointing quarterly results from major retailers due to inflation. Why the sell-off today? Well, it was a terrible quarterly report from Target, one of the nation's largest retailers. The company announcing that in the last three months, it has lost a quarter of its total value, and that brought other retailers down with it. Just yesterday, Walmart cited inflation for its own weak results. The Dow fell more than 1,100 points today. The S&P 500 slid by 4%. We spoke with Kevin Meyeroff with NCA Financial about what this means for all of us. This is a scary time, right? If the, you know, we're down 12, 15% right now. You know, what if it goes down another 10%? You know, then then, you know, can you really retire now? Do you need to work another year? You may have to do that. And by the way, just throwing this out there, I've mentioned this before. We are in a Shemitah cycle. We're in a Shemitah cycle. And, and listen, I don't have time to elaborate on that on this podcast. Go and listen to other. We did this on another podcast and we covered this. Every time that we've been in a Shemitah cycle. You can go back and trace it to the 2008 housing collapse. You could trace this to in the 90s. You could trace this during 9-11. Every single time that we've been in this Shemitah cycle, it has been absolute devastation to, to Wall Street and the economy. So all this stuff is climaxing. It's coming to a, a pinnacle. It's reaching. Uh, it's culminating. Everything's coming together. And speaking of shortages, this is sad. They even have to report this. Everyone knows by now the baby formula shortage, how bad it's gotten. It is at the time of reading this, it, it, there's been at least two children in the hospital and others have become sick because of this shortage. Now to the baby formula shortage that has parents on edge tonight. President Joe Biden is invoking the Defense Production Act to find ingredients that manufacturers need to make formula. The shortage now sending children to the hospital. Our John Sherrick explains how this is impacting one Metro Atlanta hospital. 
Children's Health Care of Atlanta telling us tonight, doctors here have admitted a few children with complex medical needs who needed specialty formulas that their parents can't find anywhere. The same at at least two other hospitals across the country. 11-week-old Clo admitted to Medical University of South Carolina Children's Health because her parents could not find the special formula she needs. Her mother telling NBC News how they resorted to pleading on social media for help. We had tried everything for her. Um, sorry. Um, to keep us out of the hospital. Chloe is one of at least four babies admitted in that hospital because formula is not available. This hospital in Memphis admitted two children, a toddler and an infant, their parents, unable to find the formula they need. It, this is a crisis for us in health care. Dr. Mark Corkins is treating the children with IV fluids and nutrition support until the formula is available. We're now out for the special formulas. And so literally, we have what we have. The, we have some things that we're trying to find, that we're trying to use some alternatives. But the, the standard ones, the ones you would think of, there, there's none to be had. Parents of infants hearing the warnings. Children's Health Care of Atlanta posting on Facebook, watering down formula to make it last longer can make your baby sick. And don't make your own formula. It could make your baby sick, cause major health problems, or even death. Doctors say parents who have run out should seek help from their OBGYNs or pediatricians until formula is back in stock. And this, this is why this is very sad. It's devastating. And it should have never happened. But we're in this. This is a real thing. I, I am just grieved at what I'm seeing. And my heart goes out to expectant mothers, and it goes out to mothers that are currently with children who rely on this formula. And it's just, and it's sad. And I think this is going to get worse. I don't think it's going to get better. I think we're going to see this more and more and more. And we're going to see this making headlines in the days and weeks to come. Oh, now what are we talking about here? Distress of nations with perplexity. Now I've talked about distress. That's, that's common sense, what distress means. But perplexity, distress of nations with Perplexity, the word perplexity there in Greek means chaos, confusion, disorientation. Like, what do we do frantically scurrying, running, looking for answers, looking for solutions, distress of nations with perplexity? The Department of Homeland Security, according to the re a recent report, is bracing for a potential surge in political violence. Once the Supreme Court hands down the official ruling that's expected to overturn Roe v. Wade, according to a new Department of Homeland Security memo. There are growing concerns about potential violence if the Supreme Court does indeed overturn Roe v. Wade. The Department of Homeland Security issued an internal <laughs> memo warning about the growing number of threats that are circulating online. NBC News national security correspondent Ken Delanian joins us now. So, Ken, we've already seen those barricades go up around the Supreme yeah. Court building in D.C. This memo, though, seems to take the concern, uh, you know, to, to a new level. Walk us through what exactly is in it. Yeah, Aaron, and this memo was prepared by DHS's Office of Intelligence and Analysis. And it says that since that draft abortion opinion was published on May 2nd, the National Capital Region's Threat Intelligence Consortium has identified at least 25 violent threats on social media that were referred to law enforcement agencies for further investigation. And the memo says that some of these threats discuss burning down or storming the Supreme Court and murdering justices and their clerks or members of Congress or lawful demonstrators. The memo adds that social media accounts have encouraged violence at abortion rights rallies by sharing images and comments of vehicles ramming into lawful protesters. It says violence has been encouraged by adherence to a broad range of ideologies and that the threats may escalate after the official decision on the abortion case is issued this summer. Now, it, this is an unclassified report, it's worth noting, based on open source reporting, which includes information from social media posts and news outlets. And the memo acknowledges that it's really going to be difficult to figure out which, if any of these threats, will actually result in violence. That's a big challenge.
Aaron. So, Ken, have we heard anything from Homeland Security since this memo has gotten out? Yes, a DHS spokesman issued a statement, and I'm just going to read it to you. It says, DHS is committed to protecting Americans' freedom of speech and other civil rights and civil liberties, including the right to peacefully protest. It adds that DHS is also committed to working with our partners across every level of government and the private sector to share timely information and intelligence, prevent all forms of violence, and to support law enforcement efforts to keep our communities safe. So they are working this problem. Again, distress of name. Men's hearts feel fear, uh, failing them for fear of the expectations of the things that are coming upon them. These are expectations. They're expecting this to happen. They're expecting the recession to get greater. They're expecting more shortages. They're expecting droughts and they're expecting famines and they're expecting more wars. Men's hearts failing them for fear of the expectations of the things which are coming upon the earth. Let's see, what else do we got here today? We've got, let's talk about this, pestilences. And there shall be pestilences. Remember the remember how we've been reporting about, and you've heard this circulating, the mysterious pediatric, they're calling this the mysterious pediatric hepatitis. The CDC is investigating a rare and mysterious outbreak of severe hepatitis in children. The World Health Organization has identified more than 170 cases in 12 countries. At least one child has died. Joining us now, Dr. Lena Alrabati, pediatric transplant hepatologist at Stanford Children's Health. And we're talking about rare cases of severe liver inflammation. How concerned should parents be at this point and what symptoms should we look out for? At this time, there is no reason for parents to be overly concerned as hepatitis in children is still uncommon. Signs and symptoms of acute hepatitis in children would include things like nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, associated with yellowing of the skin and eyes, bruising, white stools, and dark urine. And if a child was to present with these symptoms, then it would be recommended for the family to consult with their primary care physician for further evaluation. And how serious is it if children do get hepatitis? Hepatitis is inflammation in the liver, which can occur from many causes. Most of the time, an acute hepatitis can make a child feel sick, but rarely progress to liver failure. If a child does progress to liver failure, then that can be dangerous, as in many situations, liver transplantation is required as a life-saving measure. And many of the children had a common infection called adenovirus. Is it common for that to lead to hepatitis? Adenovirus is an infection that can occur in children and adults. It's usually short-lived. It presents with fever, cold-like symptoms, and diarrhea. It's not common for adenovirus infection to lead to a serious hepatitis and liver failure. And that's really the reason why the CDC and WHO is, is doing this ongoing investigation. And do health experts have any idea what could be causing these cases? Not currently. The CDC is investigating uh, adenovirus 41 and the relationship of, of that adenovirus to these hepatitis cases. Do the hepatitis A and B vaccines protect against hepatitis from adenoviruses? The hepatitis A and B vaccines are protective to children from serious forms of hepatitis against hepatitis A and B infections. It doesn't prevent adenovirus infections. Any steps parents can take to protect their children from hepatitis? The best way for parents to protect their children is to ensure that their children have up-to-date vaccinations and then using protective measures, which would include things like hand washing, staying away from sick people, and covering coughs and sneezes and so forth. Now, remember this. Somebody say rare because we've got another pestilence that started overseas that is, quote, rare, and now it's popped up in the shores of America. COVID has not gone away. In fact, a new report is saying that cases are exploding again up north, especially in New York. Officials are now recommending put your mask back on. 
New York State's health department is recommending people wear masks indoors in public spaces as COVID subvariants continue to spread. CDC data shows COVID community levels remain high in most counties across the state, seen here in orange. Some counties are at medium level in yellow. The Bronx is the only county in green at low level right now. Governor Hochul asking New Yorkers to take precautions to prevent the spread of COVID. Hospitals are, quote, again, I quote to you, are seeing surges of cases again. One headline said, quote, summer bummer. What are we talking about? I, look, guys, I'm avoiding the political, I'm avoiding, I'm avoiding politicizing this at all means. Oh, I could. And I could get into some theories, but I'm going to behave myself and I'm going to keep it biblical pestilences a smallpox like virus called monkeypox who has ever heard of such a thing well you better because what started out uh, in cases of the united kingdom spread to spain and then it went to portugal and now according to a new report has now popped up in the United States. Uh, according to a recent report, and again, they're calling this rare. Normally, monkeypox does not spread easily from person to person, but evidence of community transmission is beginning to emerge during this new outbreak. In the United Kingdom, the number of confirmed cases has now officially risen to nine, and authorities and here it is, still don't know how it's spreading. Quote, two new cases of the monkeypox virus has now been confirmed in the United Kingdom, bringing up the total number of confirmed diagnoses since May the 6th to 9. The virus, though usually self-limiting, can be deadly for one in 10 patients, according to the World Health Organization. Quote, it had been hoped that cases could be limited just to the United Kingdom, but it appears that that is not the case any longer. On Wednesday, last week, or yesterday, rather, officials in Portugal announced that they have five confirmed cases and 15 suspected cases. According to the report, quote, Portuguese, Portuguese health authorities on Wednesday confirmed five cases of monkeypox quote, a rare viral infection related to smallpox and young men marked an unusual outbreak in Europe of a disease typically limited to Africa. Oh, and by the way, I got to be careful what I say here. So I'm going to use a lot of discretion here. One individual who is on, without naming them, so that way nobody can say, oh, well, you, I heard a name drop. Nope. One individual who is on who has been on the forefront of all these diseases, I could pull up articles and show you where this individual predicted and said, be aware and be alertful that smallpox is not a matter of if, but when it comes. To America. Hmm. Very interesting. And the timing of that. Again, 15 cases are now being investigated. That's in Porto, Porto, Portugal. Meanwhile, health authorities in Spain have issued an alert over a possible outbreak of monkeypox after 23 people showed symptoms compatible with the viral infection, which has already been detected in the UK and Portugal. Following the stunning news, a top official at the CDC warned that she was, quote, very confident that we're going to see cases in the United States and no more than 20 or no more than just a few hours after making that statement. The Massachusetts Department of Public Health announced 
that a man that recently traveled to Canada has now tested positive for the virus. Massachusetts public health officials are confirming, confirming the state's first case of monkeypox. It's also the first case in the U.S. this year. Now, the infected person is a man who recently traveled to Canada. Monkeypox is a rare, potentially serious virus. It begins with flu-like symptoms, swelling of the lymph nodes, and a progressive rash on the face and the body. Health officials, though, right now say there's no risk to the public. Uh, so I'm sure that they've got this guy quarantined, and I'm sure that they are trying to do uh, contact tracing on every person that that guy was involved with all the way from the airport at Canada to his travel back to the States and his family and the people at the airport and the people at the uh, and, and everywhere that he went restaurants, this, that, and everywhere in, in the middle and in between. What am I talking about? I'm talking about there will be pestilences, plural tense, pestilences. Then, then the word of God says, let's go back. Let me pull it back up. Let me show you this. I'm almost done, guys. I'm trying to be respectful of your time. Look at Luke 21, 25, and 26, and Luke 21, 10, and 11. What does it say here? It says, watch this, there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. That's the heavens. Somebody say signs in the heavens. Then in Luke 21, 10, and 11, the gospel writer of Luke said there will be fearful sights. Somebody say sights. Somebody say fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Where? From heaven. Isn't it interesting that I thought it was, this is what I thought of as soon as I read this. Quote, Congress just finished up holding what they called a historic public UFO hearing. This morning, new green night vision video showing triangles in the sky, but this time the Pentagon offering an explanation to lawmakers. We're now reasonably confident that these triangles correlate to unmanned aerial systems in the area. The triangular appearance is a result of light passing through the night vision goggles and then being recorded by an SLR camera. But at the first congressional hearing on UFOs in 50 years, Pentagon officials admitting that most of what they call unidentified aerial phenomena remain unexplained. They also showed lawmakers this video captured by a fighter pilot with a cell phone that shows a metallic object that you might miss if you blink. I do not have an explanation for what this, this specific uh, uh, object is. Deputy Director of Naval Intelligence Scott Bray raising more eyebrows when answering this question. There have been no collisions between any U.S. assets and one of these UAPs, correct? We have not had a collision. We've had at least 11 near misses. Defense officials testifying that there were at least 18 cases where they had data from multiple sensors showing objects that moved in ways that could not be explained, adding they would share more details during a closed-door classified setting. In the past, fighter pilots and former Pentagon officials have told us some of the objects were capable of instant acceleration. <laughs> and estimated speeds of well over 13,000 miles an hour. Now, the committee says this could be the first of several hearings with some lawmakers saying next they would like to hear directly from some of the pilots who have encountered those objects firsthand. The hearing on what the U.S. government officially calls, quote, unidentified, unidentified aerial phenomenon, or UAP. Now, why are they calling it this? For years and years, all the way back when Roswell came on the scene, remember that? When the alleged crash of a, quote, UFO happened, unidentified flying object, ever since it, it's always been known as the acronym UFO or unidentified flying object. But that, we don't want to call it that anymore because that term just doesn't, it, it kind of brings fear or uns unsettledness or anxiety. So we're going to re we're going to call it something else. We're going to call it UAPs or un 
unidentified aerial phenomena. Is anybody surprised? I mean, we live in a time where everything that we grew up in my generation, what we call this is no longer called that. And what we titled that is no longer titled that. And we can't say this. And now we got to say this. Google even has a system put in place that if you type in certain phrases or titles, it will automatically correct you and put a politically correct term for what you're trying to say. So well, why are we surprised that even this is being changed? But listen, it gets deeper. Because one congressman, according to one report, even claimed that America has recovered wreckage from UFOs, not UFO, not the one in Roswell alone, but he says multiple UFOs. I mean, he came out flat out and said that we have recovered wreckage from multiple crafts, plural tense. And if the truth be known fully, it would change, and I quote, the world as we know it. This was from Tim Burchett, uh, who again is a Tennessee Republican congressman, came out and said this during this congressional hearing. Now, you say, well, Brother Ricky, you're taking it too far now. I was with you, but if you're going to start on that UFO stuff and aliens and extraterrestrials, guys, listen to me. If you're new, let me let you know where I stand on this. I am not sitting here telling you that I believe in quote unquote aliens as what the world would call extraterrestrial beings. Now, Am I saying that there's not things happening? No. Am I not saying that there was not even crafts discovered? No. Am I saying that there's not these quote unquote beans? No, I'm not saying that. What I, what I am saying for you new people, all the new viewers, not you guys that have been hanging with us for months or years and you, you know where I stand. I believe that this could ultimately lead to one of the greatest mass deceptions that Satan has ever orchestrated and pulled off in the history of mankind. Now, where do I get that? I get that out of the book of Thessalonians, where the apostle Paul warned the church of Thessalonica that when we get into the, when we get into the very edge of the tribulation. When, listen to me, when the church is removed or taken out of the equation, the restrainer is taken out and removed because as long as the restrainer is here, that is the ecclesia, that is the church, the church, what does the church do? The church exposes truth. The church brings to light that which is in darkness. The church shines a spotlight on deception and falsehood and what is phony and what is fake. Oh, y'all ain't hearing me, right? I said, Jesus said, you are salt and you are light. And he said, whatsoever is said in the dark shall be shouted on the rooftops and whatever is hidden shall be made known. How's that done? Through the church. Listen, we don't succumb to evil deeds. Paul said we expose evil deeds. So listen to me. As long as the ecclesia, as long as the church is in the earth, we are a form of a... I say the greatest restrainer that is holding back Satan's ultimate plan, which is to bring his man of the hour to the forefront and his sidekick, the false prophet, and together, read it, it's in Thessalonians. And we've talked about this countless times on other podcasts. Them two work together, and it says, with lying signs and wonders, he will deceive, if it were possible, even the very elect of God. 
And it says he will do this by all unrighteous deception. And it will be a, and it will be to those who have not accepted the truth. They have not been born again. They've rejected the gospel. And they, listen, what kind of lying signs and wonders are we talking about? Read it in Thessalonians. We're talking about fire coming out of heaven. We're talking about false miracles. We're talking, could it be, again, Listen, guys, I'm giving you something in five minutes that I did an entire segment on. I did an hour segment on this topic, and I go into greater detail than this. So I'm giving it to you in five minutes. I'm giving you a synopsis of this. I'm giving you clip notes of this. I believe that what the world calls, quote unquote, aliens or extraterrestrials is nothing more then fallen angels are Nephilims. Somehow, Satan could embody them with some type of flesh that people described and describe as short, long arms, big eyes, small features, big head, what alien enthusiasts call the grays. I call them fallen angels. I call them AKA demons. So again, what would happen if somehow God allowed Satan to carry out what the world would view as and interpret as a quote, alien invasion? Some type of, quote, craft was to make its appearance like Independence Day and show up and these, quote, extraterrestrials, a.k.a. demons, fallen angels, was to walk out of this craft. I'm telling you, the world would lose its mind. It would change humanity as we know it. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that there, there would be religious people even people who call themselves Christians who are not rooted and grounded in the word of God and in their faith, they will be the first ones that will fall at the feet of these demons and they will worship them. And I'm telling you, all the atheists and the, the godless scientists out there will come out and they will, this will give them the ammunition to say, see, we have told you all along that you and I came from these beings and these aliens and now they finally come to earth. Tell me it wouldn't happen. Prove me that I'm wrong on that. I don't think I am. I think, I'm not saying it will happen. I'm, I'm not, don't, listen, don't go out to say, well, Brother Ricky said there's going to be an alien invasion. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if, listen, if I turn on the news right now and breaking news, some type of air, some type of alien craft has landed in whatever, some country, and there's a door coming out and this beans coming out and it's wanting to communicate with mankind. I'm not going to lose my mind or lose my faith because I believe in this word of God. I, that's my truth. That's my measuring rod. And I can find the answer there. My faith will not sway. It will still be, come on, in the solid rock I stand, Jesus Christ and him alone. Now, what am I talking about today? I'm talking about, guys, we are in, look at this. Let me close with this. Let me pull up this. Here's where we're at. We're not in the tribulation yet. I know people will disagree with that, but we are not in the tribulation yet. Here's where we're at. Matthew 24, 6 and 8. Look at the end of this. He says, and we've covered all this. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled. For all these things, what things? Everything I've just told you, the pestilence, the famines. These, oh, and by the way, I didn't cover earthquakes. Earthquake. There was a huge earthquake that just struck off the coast of Australia this morning. 
we're going to see more and more of those mega quakes, giant earthquakes. He says, you're going to see all these things, the pestilence, the famines, the wars, all these things. See that you're not troubled. Is that not what it says? For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Look what he says down here at the beginning. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, why do I have, if you guys that are watching visually, I know this doesn't apply to you guys on Spotify and podcasts or listen to the podcast on the audio version of this. But if you're watching visually, there's a picture of a woman laying in a bed, holding her stomach because she is pregnant. She is in travail or she is in sorrows because she is about to give birth. Why did I pull this up today? Why did you pull this picture up, Brother Ricky? Because this, I wanted to give you a visual. If you want to know where we are on the timetable of prophecy, look at this woman on the bed. Look what's happening. She is holding her stomach. Her stomach is red with inflammation because it is signifying that she is in the beginning of sorrows. She is showing and exhibiting signs that, come on, the water is about to break. She's exhibiting signs that the child is about to come forth. I'm here to tell you, friends, that, listen, we're not in the tribulation yet. We are in the beginning of sorrows. What does that mean? If we're in the beginning of sorrows, it means it's going to get, listen, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. If you're looking for someone that's going to pat you on the back, hold your hand, and walk you through a field of tulips and lilies while you're licking on some ice cream and eating an ice cream cone and having the great day and everybody preached you smooth things you've got the wrong channel i'm going to give you the truth i'm going to give you the unadulterated truth and it's this the all these things must come to pass and the end is not yet for we are in the beginning these are the beginning of sorrows that greek word sorrows is a word that was used that we're understanding that we understand in modern vernacular as the beginning of birth pangs and if we're in the beginning of it it's only going to get worse from here it's going to get more turbulent it's going to get more trying it's going to get more difficult so you better buckle up you better get thick skin and you better get in the book get in the bible get in his presence come on get in prayer get in a gathering of believers the bible says do not forsake the fellowship with other believers even more so as you see the day approaching but listen all this is coming to pass and when i was putting this together i thought of this passage of haggai haggai chapter 2 Listen what the prophet said. For the, This is Haggai 2, 6 and 9. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, once more it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations. And they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine. The gold is mine. Come on, y'all need to hear that. I know we're going into a deep recession. I know the Wall Street's bloody right now. I know the stock market is turbulent right now. I know that your 401k is in trouble right now. I know your retirement's in trouble right now. I know that you don't know what you're going to do. I know that you're afraid that you might lose your job. I know that it looks like bad things are ahead. But I got to tell you today, the Lord is saying that the silver is mine. He's saying the gold is mine. The earth and the fullness thereof is mine. He said the glory of this temple, of this ladder temple, temple shall be greater than the former says the lord of hosts and in this place i will give peace says the lord of hosts listen i'm gonna tell you god is shaking heaven and earth and the sea and the dry land and everything that can be shaken will be shaken listen if and i said if if we're going to be alive to see a third great awakening i can't say definitively for sure that there is come we've had one great awakening we've had two great awakenings and some say that we will have a third great awakening listen i hope that we do but let me tell you this if we do if it's ever possible to have a third great awakening listen it's not going to happen until this earth 
is shaken to its core and the people begin to repent and they begin to cry out back to the Lord of hosts. They begin to cry out to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They turn from their riches. They turn from their idolatry. They turn from their deception, their falsehoods, and their empty and vain things that they've exalted above God. And they turn to the one and true living God. It will only be then. And listen, and it's got to start with the church. I'm going to talk about the church tomorrow on Friday's broadcast. Guys, there has to come an awakening, and it's got to start in the church. The world's going to be the world, but the church has got to wake up. Listen, the world is what we call woke. The world is going in this woke movement. But listen, we need the church to wake up people that profess to be believers my goodness wake up smell the car look around look what's going on and the word of the lord says that healing will not come to the land until my people that are called by my name shall humble themselves in prayer and turn from their sins and their wicked ways he says and then shall I hear from heaven and heal your land. So, guys, it comes with a revival from the inside. Revival, the word revival comes from the root word to revive. And the picture of revival means to, uh, to resuscitate something that was once breathing and alive, but it has died. It is lifeless. And to resuscitate is like taking the paddles and putting it on a dead body and resuscitating it. The actual word comes from the phrase to recover breath. So listen, we will never see another great awakening until there's a great revival. And in order for there to be a great revival, it has to come from the church house. It has to come from your house and from my house. And once revival, true revival breaks forth from the inside, it will overflow and pour into the outside. Once you go from revival, you move to awakening. And then when you get into awakening, that's when you begin to see manifest what you read about in the book of Acts, where businesses begin to shut down because the move of God is going from the inside of the church house or the inside of the temple or the inside of the synagogue and it, or the inside of your house and it's spilling out into the streets and come on, it's shutting down bars and it's shutting down clubs and it's shutting down prostitution rings and it's shutting down drug, come on lords and it's, come on, it's spilling out into the streets and you begin to see things that we read about in the early reformers and the great awakenings that George Whitfield was involved in and and uh and uh and and all these great men and women of God that were involved in these moves of God the Spurgeons and the Finneys and and uh, and the the Evan Roberts and and the list goes on that they were instrumental and they were involved and they were on the first hand accounts of these moves of God. And I'm going to tell you, and you've heard me say it before, the conditions. Here's the good news. Listen, good news, bad news. Bad news, it's dark. It's very dark. It's gross darkness is covering the earth. That's the bad news. The good news is you study out every great awakening, and I will show you that it was in the darkest hours that desperation rose up in a remnant. And when a remnant became desperate for a move of God, they began to cry out and they rend the heavens. And come on, revival came on the inside and then it spilled out into the outside and thus it birthed a great awakening. Can God do it again? Absolutely. Listen, you say, well, I don't believe that's coming. That's fine. And it may not. I pray that, but you know what? I'm just crazy enough to believe for it again. Why? Because we need it. 
I don't think God is going to rebuke me for crying out for revival and crying out for an awakening. So listen, this is where we're going to close it right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, you see this hour and how dark it is, God. My heart is grieved today as a watchman, God. Lord, I'm seeing across the board. Lord, I know I am hopeful. And I know that your word says that these things have to happen and prophecy has to be fulfilled. But God, if there is ever an opportunity or a chance for another great awakening, God, I believe the conditions are right for it now. And God, I am standing in the gap today. And I believe I've got help today. I believe there's others today that are grieved and they're vexed. And Lord, they are also standing in the gap and they're crying out and saying, God, one more time, God, let there be another great revival in the church, God. Let there be another great awakening, God. Lord, let it be done for not just us, but for our children, God. Let our children experience this, God. Our homes need to experience this, God. Our families need to experience this, God. Our nation needs to experience this, God. I pray, Father, for a mighty move and a mighty wave of repentance to sweep the land. God, that people begin to fall on their knees. They begin to cry out, Lord, in Jesus' name, in desperation and in travail, God. Let the tears flow. Let the groan come forth out of the people as they begin to intercede and as they begin to travail, Lord, for a move of God. Lord, let it start. Let it begin in us. Let it begin in the church. Let us be the forerunners of this, God. Let us cry out. Let us repent. Let us turn from our sins. Let us revive today. Let us get back on fire today. Let us get the oil back in the lamps today. Let us trim our wicks and light our fires again. Let us, Lord, draw us back into your presence, back into your word, back into the house of God, and back into a firm foundation and relationship with you, God, so that we, Lord, as for me and my house, we can serve the Lord and we can do our part and lord that that healing may come to our land but we know father and lord and god if we're going to go through this I believe with all my heart you will sustain those who are in covenant with you as you're shaking heaven and earth and the sea and the dry land. Everything that will be shaken will be shaken. But I thank you, Father, that we are citizens of an unshakable kingdom that cannot be moved. You said, Father, in your word that the very gates of hell will not prevail against the church. And we thank you for this, and we give you praise for this, and we give you glory for this today. In Jesus' name, come on, and all God's people said, amen and amen. Listen, guys, intimeheadlines.org, intimeheadlines.com. Again, if you've not subscribed to our main website, I want to implore you to do that today. Go click on subscribe, get the digest, get our app. If you're listening today, whatever platform, watching today, It's available on Apple. It's available on Android. It's free. Download it. Get our podcast. Get our latest headlines. Push yes to push notifications. You're going to get all that at your fingertips. And again, it's free. No complaining. It's absolutely free. And it doesn't use much data at all. As always, guys, we want to give you the opportunity. If you've not yet prayed about becoming a monthly partner to help support our ministry, to keep us strong, remaining. Listen, everything we do is free. It's not free to us, but it's free to you. We pay the website fees. We pay the ministry fees, everything. We pay all the the, the app. There's cost continually updating that. There is cost in ministry. Again, nothing costs to you. We feed the sheep. We bless you. All we ask as the Lord blesses you, we pray that you would pray about becoming a monthly partner of our ministry or maybe the lord put it puts it on your heart to sow a one-time gift or whatever the case would be we want to give you that opportunity you can give two different ways one is electronically right there at the app down at the bottom just hit uh, donate or you can go to the main website and donate there electronically or if you wish to give check or money order just please make it out to end time headlines p.o box 1391 and again that's monroe georgia That's 30655. As always, guys, thank you so much. 
for joining us on today's broadcast. Don't forget to share this. Don't forget to subscribe. If you're watching by Rumble, YouTube, hit the bells for notifications so that you'd be notified of when we upload a new message uh, weekly. Also, we're going to sign off for today. We plan to be back on here tomorrow. We're going to give you another uh, message that uh, I've got put together already, and we're going to share that tomorrow. Uh, so don't forget uh, to catch that uh, and don't miss that broadcast. So we're until then, may the Lord bless you, may he keep you, and may his countenance be upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to the End Time Headlines podcast. We pray that you've been blessed and equipped by today's message. For more information about how you can help partner with our ministry, please visit endtimeheadlines.org.